Ready? Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Good morning on this wonderful Kartik. Um, one Kartik note, I don't know how many of you know this, or uh, how many listen to Sachidananda Swami's inspirations every day? He gives a five minute inspiration every day that is, to put it bluntly, inspiring. Uh, quite well done. So it's a, I try to start my day every day with it to remember Kartik. Otherwise, we forget that it's a time of the year when you can, um, well, um, get a handicap. You know what a handicap is like in golf? Let's say you're a golf player like me who has scores in the thousands instead of the hundred. Uh, and you get a handicap. Okay, you're playing against someone better. So they give you a little advantage. Okay, you get an extra, um, we'll deduct from you 50 points. So it's even. So um, Kartik is a month of the handicap. And we're all spiritually handicapped in Kali Yuga. So during Kartik, you get a chance for a handicap. Whatever you do, you get a little extra credit. So uh, I do recommend the Sati Nanda Swami inspiration. I see Advaita has the link, others have it. Or you just Google Sati Nanda Swami inspiration on, um, well, just go to YouTube and put that, it'll come up. So that's, that's Kartik. Uh, yesterday we celebrated the disappearance of Narottam Das Thakur. Um, um, just to say a little comment, um, it, Narottam Das Thakur is the one who really connects us with the mood of separation from Krishna. And we'll be talking about that today in class. But all of us have a longing. If you listen to any of the love songs that um, each generation has, it always represents a longing. And the longing for Krishna is best sung by Narottam Das Thakur. In many of his songs, we sing every morning, Shri Guru Charana Padma. So many of the songs of his poetry are what connects us with that longing in our heart. So Narottam Das Thakur is quite the special person. For those who want to really deeply understand him, Sitala, um, the wife of Hari Sari, who written all the diaries of his time as Prabhupada's servant, has written a superb book on Narottam Das. I'd say absolutely superb. So if you want to understand his mood and uh, his longing and humility. And he had a frustrating life. He was blessed very early on with bhakti. And, but he missed Lord Chaitanya. He was born a little too late. And when he got to Vrindavan, um, uh, Rupa and San, Sanatana had passed already. And many stories, he just got there a little too late. And of course, that was just to increase his longing. And then he met his guru, um, uh, Lokanas Swami. And when he did, um, that is an extraordinary adventure. But I'll leave that for you to read because that's not today's topic. I just wanted to bring us um, up to date. Oh, um, Prabhupada made an interesting comment. Uh, every day there's so many newspapers with so much information uh, confirming without a doubt that Kali Yuga is progressing. It just confirms it every day. And Prophet said, but we could publish a newspaper on the spiritual news every day. Every, even every hour we can publish a thick newspaper on it. So sometimes I like beginning classes with some of the spiritual news, just a little piece of what's out there. And it kind of gets our consciousness fixed. So today's uh, class covers an interesting topic, to say the least. Um, and uh, we, we have so many verses. How do you do it? There's like, okay. And then, then you do the, uh, yeah, that's 51. So where, oh, clever. 
Thank you. Okay, so we're going to begin with uh, verse 32. So I'll begin. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate This uh, chapter, just to give a context, uh, as you heard from classes earlier this week, um, Krishna has left the planet. The uh, Kurus left the planet in a most unusual way. Um, and you've heard these stories, we won't go into it. There's questions on that, I'm glad to answer it. When I first heard that story, that sure raised a lot of questions for me. So if you have some, we can talk about that later. Um, and now the Pandavas start retiring. And in these verses, each of these great souls um, decides it's time to return to their original position. In the case of some, it's returning to Krishna. In the case of others, um, returning to their post, such as um, become restoring the post of Yamaraj or other posts. So, um, and there's a great moral to this story. So uh, we'll start with the verses. We'll, uh, we're going to pause at verse 50 and read the purport, but uh, we can start reading beginning with verse 32. I'll begin. Upon hearing of Lord Krishna's return to his abode, and upon understanding the end of the Yadu dynasty's earthly manifestation, Maharaj Yudhisthira decided to go back home, back to Godhead. And we'll go to verse 33. Kunti, after overhearing Arjuna's telling of the end of the Yadu dynasty and disappearance of Lord Krishna, engaged in the devotional service of the transcendental personality of Godhead, with full attention, and thus gain release from the course of material existence. Supreme Unborn Lord Sri Krishna caused the members of the Yadu dynasty to relinquish their bodies, and thus he relieved the burden of the world. This action was like picking out a thorn with a thorn, though both are same to the controller. The Supreme Lord relinquished the body which he manifested to diminish the burden of the earth, just like a magician. He relinquishes one body to accept different ones, like the fish incarnation and others. When the personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna, left this earthly planet in his self-same form, from that very day, Kali, who had already partially Kali, who had already partially appeared, became fully manifest to create inauspicious conditions for those who are endowed with a poor fund of knowledge. <laughs> was intelligent enough to understand the influence of the age of Kali. Characterized by the increasing avarice, falsehood, cheating, and violence throughout the capital, state, home, and among individuals. So he wisely prepared himself to leave home, and he dressed accordingly. Thereafter, in the capital of Hastinapur, he enthroned his grandson, who was trained and equally qualified as the emperor and master of all land bordered by the seas. Then he posted Raja, the son of Indra, grandson of Lord Krishna, at the Mathura as the kings of Sureshna. Afterwards, Maharaj Yudhisthira performed a Prabhajataya sacrifice and placed himself in the fire for quitting household life. Maharaj Yudhisthira, who had once re relinquished all his garments, belt, and ornaments of the royal order, and became completely disinterested and unattached to everything. Then he amalgamated all the sense, sense organs into the mind, 
then into the mind. In, then he amalgamated, amalgamated all the sense organs into the mind, and then the mind into life, life into breathing, his total existence into the embodiment of the five elements, his body into death. Then, as pure self, he became free from the material conception of life. Thus annihilating the gross body of five elements into the three qualitative modes of material nature, he merged them in one nescience, and then absorbed that nescience in the self, Brahman, which is inexhaustible in all circumstances. After that, Maharaj Yudhisthira dressed himself in torn clothing, gave up eating all solid foods, voluntarily became dumb and let his hair hang loose. All this combined to make him look like an urchin or madman with no occupation. He did not depend on his brothers for anything, and just like a deaf man, he heard nothing. He then started towards the north, treading, treading the path accepting by his forefathers, accepted by his forefathers and great men, to devote himself completely to the thought of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and he lived in that way wherever he went. The younger brothers of Maharaj Yudhisthira observed that the age of Kali had already arrived throughout the world and that the citizens of the kingdom were already affected by irreligious practice. Therefore, they decided to follow in the footsteps of their elder brother. They all had performed all the principles of religion and as a result, rightly decided that the lotus feet of the Lord Sri Krishna are the supreme goal of all. Therefore, they meditated upon his feet without interruption. Thus, by pure consciousness due to constant devotional remembrance, they attained the spiritual sky, which is ruled over by the Supreme Narayana, Lord Krishna. This is attained only by those who meditate upon the one Supreme Lord without deviation. This abode of Lord Sri Krishna, known as Galoka Vrindavana, cannot be attained by persons, persons who are absorbed in the material conception of life. But the Pandavas, being completely washed of all material contamination, attain that abode in their very same bodies. Vidura, while on pilgrimage, left his body at Prabhas. Because he was absorbed in thought of Krishna, he was received by the denizens of the Petri Loka planet, where he returned to his original post. Draupadi also saw that her husbands, without caring for her, were leaving home. She knew well about Lord Vasudev, Krishna, the personality of Godhead. Both she and Subhadra became absorbed in thoughts of Krishna and attained the same results as their husband. Now we can do one more verse. The subject of the departure of the sons of Pandu for the ultimate goal of life back to Godhead is fully auspicious and is perfectly pure. Therefore, anyone who hears this narration with devotional faith certainly gains the devotional service of the Lord, the highest perfection of life. Okay, and we're going to go back to verse 50. And um, I'm going to, who's the best Sanskrit chanter here? Who's that? Okay. No, but we'll actually, because there are so many verses to read, we'll just do that. And uh, you can read the purport too, please. Either one of you. Oh, oh, we just read the translation. Yeah, yeah. When flying an airplane, one cannot take care of other planes. Everyone has to take care of his own plane. And if there is any danger, no other plane can help another in that condition. Similarly, at the end of life, when one has to go back home, back to Godhead, everyone has to take care of himself without help rendered by another. Help is, however, offered by the offered on the ground before flying in space. Similarly, the spiritual master, the father, the mother, the relatives, the husband, and others can all render help during one's lifetime. But while crossing the sea, one has to take care of himself and utilize the instructions formerly received. Draupadi had five husbands, and no one asked Draupadi to come. 
Draupadi had to take care of herself without waiting for her great husbands. And because she was already trained, she at once took to concentration upon the lotus feet of Lord Vasudev, Krishna, the personality of Godhead. The wives also got the same result as their husbands in the same manner. That is to say, without changing their bodies, they reached the destination of Godhead. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur suggests that both Draupadi and Subhadra, although her name is not mentioned herein, got the same result. None of them had to quit the body. So, um, all these great souls um, had... Uh, at the end of their life, a change of heart. Their whole life, they cultivated their relationship with Krishna. And at the end, they said, we're going to drop it all. So let me give you a song that will help you with this. Um, this is by a wonderful devotee, Mangalananda, who some of you know. Caterpillar changed his mind and woke to find himself refined. His old self had to die for him to be a butterfly. He tired of walking on the ground and so around himself he wound a screen of silken strands, veil untouched by human hands. And something subtle changed within Reflected by his changing skin He had a change of heart And wished to play another part he and if he could, then so could I. I want to free my mind, to rise beyond the waves of time. Beyond this burning dark abyss, up to that land of love and bliss, where grows a flower sweet, applied to Krishna's lotus feet. Mangalananda is just so good at these things, um, so good at it. Um, so, um, what's the point here? Um, I don't remember if um, I um, 
did I tell this class, I, a lot of different classes here and there, the story of Sachinanda Swami and the butterfly? I didn't. Oh, that I told. Um, uh, well, we'll tell it. Uh, this is an intimate story. When Sachi Nanda Swami was here last time, um, we um, do as we always do when we get together, take a half a day and just sneak away someplace. But there's things we have to talk about. And so I said to him, I'm going to take you to a special place this time. The time before he wanted to see an alligator. So we took him to the prairie. And this gives us a chance to talk about certain intimate things. But I was, I took him to the butterfly atrium at the Harn Museum. Who's been to the butterfly atrium? It's quite a remarkable place. And who's been there? Thousands of butterflies just surround you. You walk through double lock airlock doors because they're not native butterflies. They don't want them to escape. And, and they're just surrounded by butterflies landing on you and all over the place. It's quite heavenly. So I took him there. It's a very nice, and it was during the day. It's not crowded at all. So it was a perfect time for us to talk. And then we sat on a bench while butterflies are landing on us. And then he told me a shocking story. He said, this is the time for me to share this story. His father, some of you may know, was a Nazi SS guard in concentration camps. Yeah. His father, who died just last year, lived an old life, had nightmares the rest of his life and always regretted it. He wasn't a mean, nasty person, but you get caught up in these things. I mean, uh, we find even among our devotees, sometimes there's some deviation and devotees get caught up in it. It's, a, it's something with the ego. Um, you see, people can always get caught up. So he got caught up in the fervor of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime. There's a lot of history behind it. Um, just briefly after World War I, the Allies who defeated Germany were stupid, absolutely stupid. And they did reparations on Germany and took all their money to pay for it and made life miserable. And it was so bad that if a German wanted to buy a loaf of bread, they'd need a wheelbarrow of money, literally it was so inflated. And, and so naturally, it opened the door for somebody like Hitler to rise. After World War II, General Marshall did the Marshall Plan. We're going to rebuild the people we conquered. And when they did it, Germany became America's practically biggest ally after Britain and the world, because they rebuilt it. So, and we find if we study the history of the Roman Empire, they did the same thing when they'd conquer someone, then they would rebuild their infrastructure, put the aqueducts in, water supply, and let people worship in their own way. They just had to be loyal to it. And if we study the Mahabharata, we find the same thing, how civilized people behave even after a war. This is what they do. So. We had this mess of World War II. His father's a Nazi guard in a concentration camp. And these very religious Jews who were being marched to their death had a staging area where they'd meet. And in the staging area, they would draw butterflies on the wall. So his father went to one of the um, prisoners about to be executed and says, I want to know what that butterfly is. And he said, I cannot tell you what it is. And the reason he couldn't tell him, because most Nazi guards, if they understood the reason, would want to torture the prisoners even more. He says, I can't tell you. So Satyananda's father said, listen, I have ways of extracting information from you. We have torture chambers, we have all these things here, but I don't like hurting people. He wasn't a bad person. So please just tell me, because you're going to tell me now or you're going to tell me later, but don't make me do this. Just tell me. He says, okay, I'll tell you, but please don't share it. Why were they drawing butterflies? 
because these very religious people understood as a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, they are just transitioning to another life and they really couldn't be killed. And the Nazis would be very upset by that. And, and this story struck Sachinanda Swami so deeply. First, his father did have some compassion. And like I said, the rest of his long life, he had nightmares and regretted it every day. And, and the idea is, is that if we really understand spiritual depth, we understand there's a transition that occurs. This chapter is about that transition. Now, I had a conversation recently, just this week, with my brother that I think it's appropriate to share in class. My older brother, who I'm very close to, um, has Parkinson's. And so I have to help him out with a lot of things. Um, his insurance and medical and this, this and that. But to some degree, his physical therapy is giving him some improvement. So we, but he said to me the other day, I'm really lamenting because I'm fading away. So I pointed out his physical therapist said, at least you're getting better in some areas. I said, yes, but I know it's all going to end. And I said, so what? And I don't know, Christian, my heart inspired me to say the right things. You know, sometimes that happens to all of us in spite of ourselves. And I said to him that, listen, I don't have that much longer. You know, we know how old our parents live. You know, we live a little better life. Maybe we'll live a little longer. You know, maybe not. You know, who knows how long? 10, 20, five years, five minutes. I said, so what? We're leaving anyway. I'm excited about it. I like where I am. I'm fairly content with my seva in my life. But I'm going to go on to a new and exciting adventure. I can't imagine how amazing it's going to be. So I'm ready for a new adventure when it comes. So I'm here for this adventure. And then we get my new adventure. What's the harm? And he turns to me and says, how do you know this? So I explained to him, nothing else makes sense. You know how karma explains certain things. And he said, wow, what an attitude. Now he goes to the synagogue every week, has this rabbi he loves, and he couldn't understand the first point that you're not this body. You're not this body. Couldn't understand that first point. So he was kind of amazed by what I said. Not as amazed as I was by what I said. I didn't know where I came from. But these things happen. So uh, that's kind of what we're dealing with here. Now, um, how many of you think you're not this body? OK. Um, how many of you, well, let me ask different question. How many of you are Indian? <laughs> ah, you got it. Okay. Trick question. <laughs> okay. I learned that trick from Borishat Prabhu. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he gave this whole lecture on you're not this body. And then at the end, he says, I see a lot of Punjabis in this class. How many of you are Punjabi? And Butch, raise your hand. <laughs> Uh, that was his Radhastabi lecture, if someone wants to hear it. So, what's going on here? So, um, the, all these great people, we, we, did they have a change of heart? I mean, they're all Krishna conscious from the beginning, but they're actors in a play. I mean, these, these are leelas going on. So, they're trying to show a transition, just like Mangala Nanda sung at the end of their life, we're dropping it all. Now we're getting serious. And Prabhupada gives the example uh, in the purport here of a pilot flying a plane. How many of you have been a pilot? Okay, well, one. Um, I'm not very good at it, by the way. 
Yeah. Uh, what's that? Flying this plane. Oh, flying this plane, yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember the first time I soloed, what a thrill that was. I wasn't really ready for it, but the um, instructor said, it was just a little 60 horsepower plane on a dirt runway. He said, you take it around once yourself, take off and land. And it was such a thrilling experience, but scary like anything. There, there's no instructor. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And besides that, I'm half blind. So it's a little hard to land the damn thing. But anyway, that's another matter. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure. I don't have any depth reception. I wasn't quite sure where the runway was, but I usually make a good guess. <laughs> and um, so, so uh, but um, it, 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 when I read that purport, it reminded me of that experience. Um, and, and there is a certain sense where all the training he had given me um, I had to apply, otherwise I kill myself. Um, and so I had to apply all of that training and say, okay, now I'm on my own in this cockpit. And it, it's actually quite thrilling uh, to do that. So question arises, arises, are you really on your own? You have your spiritual master, your God brothers, God sisters, friends, you have you know, all this. To some degree, we are really alone at that moment. I mean, we have people chanting in our ear and playing tapes and everything, but there's that internal meditation where we actually have to say, do I really, really want to connect with Krishna? That's that last opportunity. Because we have a life of constant practice, a life of classes, a life of chanting, then we're ready for it. And if we're not ready, as Prabhupada has described, Krishna will give special mercy anyway. So one way or other, it works. But there's um, a, a, an old saying that um, there are two things that are certain, death and taxes. And if you live a certain place, you may not have taxes, but every place, you know, the death is there. So we obviously, and you all know this inside out, don't know when that day would occur. I remember when I was in seventh grade, I had something that changed my whole life. Um, Jeanette Kellum was a girl in my class and um, we knew each other. I mean, we weren't uh, super friends, but we knew each other well. We end up in all the same classes. And she was sitting in class one day and she fell over dead. Yeah, brain aneurysm, blood vessel burst, fell over. As you can see, I'm still shocked by it. It was such a shocking event for me to see. I remember her name, I know what she looks like. She actually even looks like one of you in this class I saw, but I won't say who, because I don't want them to think they have to fall over dead to emphasize this point. And, and um, um, then uh, after that happened, I, it was a wonderful thing. Of course, I said I'm half blind. I couldn't do sports as a kid, so I, I tried to get away from people, spent a lot of time in the woods, and I just went in the woods every day just to wonder, what is death? What is it? Of course, intuitively, I understood one thing. No one can die. It just, you can't. I understood it. It's impossible, but I'm seeing people die. And, you know, some my neighbor's grandmother died, and another no, neighbor's grandfather. And, but then somebody I knew, and I knew moderately well, just fell over dead. I said, it was a mystery, but I went to see rabbis and philosophers, no one can answer that question. Then I read the Gita and it started making sense, but it's such a shocking thing because we're all going to die and we all are going to have to solo in our airplane for a moment. So what's going on in this chapter is, is a wonderful exercise for us because beginning in verse 40, we understand what each of them did at that time, uh, you know, uh, Maharaj Yudhishthir dropped all his royal clothes 
and um, then he he did the yoga process of amalgamating his body and and um, and then he dressed himself in torn clothes and he became like an avaduta death man. I don't want to talk to him, but I don't want to see anybody. No, I'm not saying this is what we do. He's a different person than us. But you can see each of them did something and then he started going north. Now, of course, this is one of the mysteries is when you get to the North Pole, how do you go north? But that's another matter. Um, and then the younger brothers saw the Kali Yuga had come. So what did they do? Um, uh, then they purified their consciousness and again transitioned. Vidura went back to his post of Yamaraj. Uh, Dropity. Now it's very interesting. There was the women were on their own. The women were, were not um, uh, the chattel of the men. The women had to do their own solo flying. There was no distinction in here between men and women. It's all equal. And in the very verse we're doing today, uh, Dropity saw the husbands left without caring for her. And now it's my job to do my own thing and leave. And then um, we end the chapter and then Kali Yuga begins. So this chapter is instructing us two things. First, we do a lifetime of preparation. And then at the end, each of us has our own particular way of leaving. It's not the same for everybody. Somebody leaves this way, somebody leaves that way. But if we're doing this practice, we know we're going to leave Krishna conscious. Now, none of us are the great yogis who can sit there and meditate and our body goes into flame. And you know, that's not our thing. And that's not the way we left. That's not the way Prabhupada left. So I'm going to pause here and see if there's any questions, comments, uh, realizations. Uh, yes. It's a bit of a peculiar question, so please forgive me if it sounds strange, but um, it, it, it is said that the Bhagavatam is like a study of the holy name or, or a summary of the glories of the holy name. So I'm just wondering, here we have these exalted personalities and it's described in this chapter that it's already on the cusp of Kali Yuga. So in some parts of the Bhagavatam, it makes it clear that the holy name is the highest practice. But why? Why are some of these personalities leaving by doing these you know, yogic processes from Satya Yuga? Why aren't they this chanting? That, that's not a weird question. That's a very good question. Anybody have an answer to that? It's a very nice question. Let's see if there are any realizations or answers. Anybody would like to answer that? I'll take a stab at it, but let's see if the collective wisdom has a good answer. That's actually a really Superb question. Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering, wasn't this like in a different yuga? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So um, the Mahamantra didn't used to be just shared freely, right? It used to be like a secret. Only some people would have it. And it was particularly like given in this yuga because you were so <laughs> desperate, yeah. so fallen. And so that's our way in this yuga, but in other yugas, there were different ways of uh, yeah. attaining the same result. I was thinking the same thing. Prabhupada Priya, you have something you want to add? Uh, microphone to, to the back, please. Along the same lines that uh, Lord Chaitanya came to inaugurate the Yuga Dharma. So Lord Chaitanya hadn't come yet at this point. So the, yeah. the, the path of the process of chanting the holy names, which is what you're supposed to do in Kali Yuga, it hadn't been like officially inaugurated yet. So the Pandavas were sticking to what had been officially inaugurated previously. And and it doesn't say they weren't chanting Krishna's name. They I mean they were thinking of Krishna. I mean we know that. That's what their whole life was about. So did they think of it through the name or the form or pastime? What did they do? That detail is not given here. And uh, the detail that is given is 
that they followed the process and the process they followed was the process of that particular yuga. And ours, we're not going to sit and meditate on our belly button and burst into flames and do those kind of things. And, you know, sometimes we see people trying to do that. And uh, frankly, they're not very successful. You know, the best they can get. Um, I had a science visitor visiting, so I took him to hear some famous yogi in this area who gives classes uh, near Alachua. So I took him out. He wanted to meet this person because he had financially supported their science project. So we went out to the lecture and he gives a very good lecture on your not this body. But he can't get beyond that. So I, I said to I, I've known this guy for 40 years. So I said to him after the lecture, well, I can say who it is. It's Mickey Singer. So he gives a very good lecture and you're not this body. So I said to Mickey afterwards, Mickey, what a nice lecture on chapter two of the Gita. You really nailed it. And he understood what I was saying. And he turns to me and says, you know, I do know the other chapters. <laughs> yeah, but you never talk about it. <laughs> yeah, he understood what I was We know each other well, so we banter like that sometimes. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments? That was a nice question you asked, though. Any other comments? Yes, but we'll let you grab a microphone. On this topic of transformation, uh, as you have to go on transformation at the time of death, I was also thinking how throughout life you have to, you know, your caterpillar and then there's different processes before you become the butterfly. Um, can you have, give some tips uh, of when transformation happens in our life? It's usually not so pleasant. Uh, before the butterfly is born, it's not that it looks pretty while it's happening. Um, yeah, so. yeah, it can be painful. It is. Um, when we're, yeah, um, Krishna says in the Gita that the bhakti yoga is joyfully performed. So it's the actual bhakti yoga that's the joyful part. And sometimes as we're giving up certain attachments, it can be painful. But it's like sometimes you have a boil and then it's lanced by the doctor. It's painful, but boy, you sure feel better afterwards. So sometimes there's, that pain can be quite purified. One time I had an injury and uh, my leg muscle was quivering very badly. A friend had taken me to the emergency room and something happened with my back. And it wouldn't stop quivering like mad. And uh, I don't know what happened. I just started laughing almost hysterically. I thought it was so funny. Thought, this thing here is not me and it's just shaking and everything's upset and like that. And then I realized maybe I'm learning something after, it was like, you know, five, six years ago. I said, after 40 years of chanting Hare Krishna, maybe I learned something because I thought it was really funny. And so eventually we reach the point where when these painful things happen, we kind of find it's really funny. It is. And you get to that point. So it takes a while, but you know, there's a transition area. It's the clearing stage. Even when we're chanting, we have the clearing stage. So what's the secret? The secret, I'll whisper it. Just keep sticking to it. Because if you just keep sticking to it, it will always be successful. Now, how do I know that? Well, I can see case after case. I can read story after story in Shastra. We have, I was once at New Talavan with Prabhupada. There's that famous picture of him cooking on a white stove. And then many of you have seen it. I got to taste a piece of it. Wow, it was really good. Um, and Prabhupada turned to the devotees there, and he said this also other places, but this one I personally heard, and he said, if you chant 16 round and follow the principles, you will go back to Godhead. And he says, 
it is guaranteed by Krishna. He says, I'm guaranteeing it. And he, said, he said very seriously. First, he said it kind of in a jovial way. Then he turned and said, this is for real. I'm just paraphrasing what he said. You will. It's guaranteed. Just stick to it. So your mind is going to say, you don't want to stick to it. At least if your mind's like my mind, it will do that. And say, what about this? What about this? The mind's accepting, constantly rejecting. So one of the arts we learn is how to look at the mind. And what's the secret of looking at the mind? That's the secret I just told you. That's it. My mind says, I really want to sleep in for an extra three hours today. And you just look at it and say, Gee, isn't that funny what my mind just said? <laughs> and at that exact moment, your mind no longer controls you. You just look at the mind. That's the whole secret of mindfulness meditation. There's this famous um, uh, John Cabot Zinn. He's kind of a, he's at the Massachusetts uh, General Hospital. And he's a, uh, not a physician, but a psychologist. I've heard him speak at the University of Florida and other places, brilliant, nice person. And he teaches mindfulness meditation. And what he does, these are people at the hospital who have intense pain. Maybe they have cancer or work back or super intense pain. And there's only one solution medically. There is no other, and that is dull them out with pain medicine, oxycotins, or this heavy pain medicine. If you give somebody enough morphine, they don't care about the pain, but they don't care about anything else at all either. Nothing. They care about nothing. Um, when the last emperor of the Mughal Empire was captured at Hanuman's Hanuman, fort in New Delhi, 80-year-old emperor, and the um, uh, Major Hopkins, who defeated the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857, those who know the history, and England claimed India for the crown. When he was captured by Major Hopkins, he didn't know he had been captured. He was so stoned on opium. He had no idea, and they sent him to exile in Burma, and he didn't know where he was. Just so much opium. So the British said, hey, take all the opium you want. That solves our problem. And, and, and that's what happens. So, so, um, uh, so this um, John Kabat-Zinn said there has to be a better way and introduce mindfulness meditation for people in intense pain. And the results were tremendous. These people would look at their pain and, and it's just what the Gita is teaching. You, you, you know, we had the mind, intelligence, you know, false you know, false ego, and the real self. It's, it's the same sequence the Gita is teaching. And he just did the lower level of that sequence. Didn't go all the way up. I mean, but he just taught them: you're not this, you're you're not this mind. So look at the mind, and these people would start living an eighty percent normal life without taking intense drugs. And he spoke on this at the University of Florida uh, about 15 years ago. And then I heard him speak at a training convention I went to for my mediation training. And the results are phenomenal. So if and this same thing the Gita is teaching. So how to look at the mind. So here's the secret. Here's what you do. You can do this multiple times a day. It works. Just pause. Take a pause and, and look at what your mind's doing. You're about to open a doorknob imperceptibly. You just pause for a moment. Say, what am I doing? You just, and you're going to watch your mind. Then your mind's no longer going to control you. Though I will personally admit that in the morning, when it's that time to get up, it is a battle with my <laughs> mind. And, 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 and uh, Bhakti Siddhanta used to say, but you beat your mind, I think, in the morning with a shoe and at night with a broomstick. That's how he put it. So that's what we need to do. Does that help?
Okay, with that, it's prashadam time. Sorry, Ra, and all that stuff. Okay, Hare Krishna. Thank you very much.